she's going to make us some money. Are you hungry? Okay, everyone, we're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you so much for joining us today. I am uh, Dr. Denise Struthers. I'm with Healing Communities, and we are a faith-based organization that uh, train churches in the area of uh, prison reentry, human trafficking, justice involved youth, domestic violence. And uh, this topic today is very dear. Uh, I had the opportunity to do my doctoral work in sex trafficking. So I've done a lot of research. And what I have found is that there is very little uh, research that focuses on the correlation between homelessness and human trafficking. And so commercial sex is a way of life for many homeless youth. So our sister here, Dr. Amy, as I like to call her, whenever I think of her, I think of her as uh, the Wonder Woman, you know, the woman with the cape, uh, because it is people like this that are my heroes and my sheroes. I'm just going to read a little bit of her bio. Uh, if you register, you, you saw uh, that I had her information there. But I was, I really like this part. Dr. Amy Angel it has created the H3 project on January 1st, 2020, right before the pandemic hit. So I can't wait to hear uh, how they were able to thrive in uh, the midst of uh, COVID. Uh, but it says uh, that she uh, created it to creatively address the issue of homelessness and human trafficking in Washington, D.C. Through previous work with other D.C. homeless agencies, she recognized a need that was not being met. So that right there uh, just uh, had me, and I am so happy uh, to have uh, the opportunity to honor her today for recognizing that need. So Dr. Amy, uh, please, by all means, let's go. Thank you so much. You're so, so very sweet. And I don't know about the, the hero and the hero, but I do appreciate it. So I just wanted to start with um, this video. Uh, some of you may have seen it. Uh, for those who, who haven't, it kind of uh, gets us started about uh, why uh, why I do what I do. Are we on camera? Yeah, baby. They need Make to sure to show this at the that. wedding tomorrow. It's for They're filming a bachelor party ever amounting to anything good. Oh. That's not a freedom. That's not a freedom. That's up here on the right. Hey, up here on the right. Whoa. Where do the high school girls hang out? I can show it to Sarah later, right? Oh. The single most lucrative commercial enterprise in the world. The fastest growing crime on the planet. Look at that girl. <laughs> Man, we're going to get shot. Boys, yes. welcome to heaven. Sit. It's a reality. You're talking about hundreds of billions of dollars. This is not a lifestyle choice. It'll be as long as you want to want to make it, you know. <laughs> we live in a world where we don't necessarily know what's going on next door. Yeah, I don't even know where we yeah. are right now. Oh yeah, some, know, some serious massage. <laughs> if you're not seeing it, you're not looking for it. What kind of place is this? It's everywhere. It's not even light out. They live under constant threat of violence, under constant threat or actual sexual abuse. Um, they are given only enough food to sustain them. 
particular one girl who was crying as she told her testimony. She wasn't crying because she had been forced into the sex trade. She wasn't crying because she had been beaten and raped. She wasn't crying because she'd been stripped naked and chained. She wasn't crying because her so-called parents had shoved a baton down her throat to get her to do it. She was crying because after her rehabilitation, which was coming to an end, she had nowhere else to go other than to return to those parents. Sweet cherry, a flame change my name. No, was always the same. Tell the money what you find when you climb. And check the radio. You see, there are 12 year old girls, 15 year old girls who had been kidnapped and their virginity was being sold to the highest bidder. You can do that now. Press turbo so soon. Vroom, vroom, them on a blast off and to the moon. But you might get caught in a temple of doom. You might get caught in a temple of doom. I said, moonlight illuminate my night. By day, sun ray make the people. The first instance in the sex industry, what makes slavery modern there is AIDS. You have a timeline on how long you can use a human being. And then when they're done, you just find them. During the transatlantic slave trade, the value of the young male agricultural worker on U.S. soil was an equivalent of $40,000 today. You can buy that same young male agricultural worker on U.S. soil for about $300 today. Forget justice is what love looks like in public. It's time for the world to focus on acknowledging that slavery still exists. It's never gone away. But we put people on the moon. We have dolphin friendly tuna. Why can't we do the same for kids and people? Are we on camera? Yep. Okay, and so that's why I and um, my team do what we do. We are a 501c3 uh, nonprofit based in Washington, D.C. at Union Station. Union Station is one of the, um, the top transportation hubs in the United States, but D.C. also is in the top five for human trafficking in the United States. We are 75 to 80 percent on the street, direct street engagement with those uh, experiencing homelessness or human trafficking. And the rest of that time, uh, you know, 15 to 20 percent necessary admin uh, filing things and uh, doing notes in the office. Human trafficking is the fastest growing illicit trade in the world. It uh, generates over 150 billion every single year. Over 40 million individuals are living as slaves worldwide. That's five times the size of Switzerland. Globally, right now, the average cost of the slave is just $90. So some goals for this training. We want to recognize and be able to define what human trafficking is, recognize, be able to determine individuals more at risk to traffickers, uh, develop a comprehensive understanding of how human trafficking intersects with homelessness, and then gain skills and knowledge to identify signs of human trafficking and be that agent of change in your community. So firstly, according to the Global Slave uh, Slave Index of 2021, this 40, over 40 million folks that are living uh, as slaves worldwide, um, so we got these numbers, but really what is human trafficking? How's it defined? We, we need to kind of dive into that so that we can get a, a general perspective of how we might be able to combat it. So the federal definition, yes, all of the, the legal term right now, human trafficking um, 
is a crime involving the exploitation of a person for labor, services, or commercial sex. Sex trafficking is the recruitment, harboring, transportation, provision, obtaining, patronizing, or soliciting of a person for the purpose of a commercial sex act, in which a commercial sex act is induced by force, fraud, or coercion, or in which the person's under the age of 18. Forced labor is also the recruitment, harboring, transportation, provision, or obtaining of a person for labor services, again, through the use of force, fraud, or coercion, for the purpose of subjection to involuntary servitude, panage, debt bondage, or slavery. So you notice uh, uh, this common theme, force, fraud, or coercion are evident. Force is meaning using um, using uh, some type of force to control the individual. That could be raping, that could be holding it down, that could be having a knife to the throat. Fraud is using lies to control the, uh, the individual. Like, um, I love you. If you love me, you're going to do this. Um, if you don't do this, I'm going to get hurt. You owe me. Coercion is using the threats to control someone. I know where you live. I know where your sister goes to school at. I know where your parents live. You took those pictures for me. I'm going to get, I'm going to send them to everybody, especially in this day and age with the social media. I'm going to send all of this to everybody if you don't do what I, what I want you to do. So there's lots of, it's basically any situation in which an individual is receiving little to no pay and they do not feel free to leave. So it's important to note um, there's three, three, uh, three main conditions for trafficking to occur. That's the act with the means and the purpose. So the act for, for labor and sex, you know, we, that's the recruit, the transport, the transfer, the harbor, the receive. We've got the means, the threat or use of force. We've got the coercion, fraud, deception, abuse of a position of vulnerability, giving payments or benefits, abduction, we uh, definitely read about some of the, uh, 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 in some cases, we've got, you know, someone that was abducted 14 years, right? And then we've got the purpose. All of these together uh, for exploitation is the trafficking. Also known as modern day slavery, it is taking place everywhere. There is literally, just as it was kind of said in the video, if you're not doing something, you know, you, you're closing your eyes. It is, it's hidden in plain sight. It's modern day slavery. It's in front of you. Every single one of you have seen someone being trafficked at some point in time, but now it's up to you to recognize those signs so that you can do something about it. So let's talk a bit about, especially where it's concerning homelessness, while we know labor trafficking is actually the, the majority of trafficking worldwide, but when it combines with homelessness, the 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 majority of what we see in, with those elements is the sexual exploitation. So we're going to go a little bit more to the sexual exploitation so that we can wrap that in together. Sexual exploitation also takes, um, there's uh, three main elements. That's the recruitment, that's the grooming, and that's the turning out. Recruitment can look a lot of places. Um, I can tell you uh, places like um, malls, like uh, bus terminals, airports, fairs, concerts, festivals, any place where there's going to be a, a lot of people all typically having a good time, you know, um, involved in going about whatever they're going to be is a, the perfect ground for individuals that are looking to exploit someone else. Third party exploiters, uh, Primarily, it's not, we, you know, sometimes we see on television, we think of the um, the trafficker as maybe that um, older guy with a, a wife beater shirt with gold chains. You know, we've got that, that classic definition that the television sometimes tells us. That's not the most successful traffickers and exploiters. They are going to be charismatic. They're going to want you to like them. They are going to shower you with attention. You, they're going to make you feel like you are on top of the world. And so let's say you've got a group of um, high school girls walking through a mall. Someone that is there to look, looking to exploit uh, one of these females, they're not gonna choose the one that's the most pretty. They're not gonna choose the one that's maybe leading the others. They're not gonna choose the one that is uh, displaying an obvious uh, sense of, of confidence and, um, and uh, you know, maybe uh, commanding attention and, and recognizing that. They're gonna look for that individual who's maybe lagging a little bit behind, maybe who isn't as well-dressed as the other, maybe with their eyes downcast. Though That's gonna be the individual that they are looking for because what they want is they, they wanna identify those with low, low self-esteem. Then um, 
when engaging with that individual, they're going to ask about family connections. Oh, so, hey, where do you live? Uh, do you live with your parents? If there is a strong sense of family, oh, I get along with my siblings. I've, um, yes, my, I've got a, a two-parent household. That's not going to be what they're looking for. They're looking for that individual who's either with a single parent who maybe is working double jobs to you know, put things on the table or maybe just absent from the home a lot or foster uh, system. Foster system has an exorbitantly high amount of individuals that are exploited and trafficked just because there, there isn't that constant attention. They're looking for the weak familiar social connections, the low self-esteem, and they also are looking to, um, to see what, what, uh, what needs and wants are being unmet. Uh, that's where the groomy comes in. Oh, you know what? Oh, you want your nails done? Let's go get your nails done. Oh, your hair. Uh, oh, I bet you would look great with, uh, you know, some blonde highlights in your hair. Uh, they're going to give the, uh, they're, they're going to shower the individual with a lot of attention. Um, there's going not, there's not going to be the rules that are typically governing all oh, this is, this is just a party time. It, it's, it's fun. Uh, there, don't worry about anything. I've got you. I'm going to protect you. Um, we're just out to have a good time and life is fantastic. And then what happens when we get down, we're breaking down the individual or breaking them down slowly to become what the, the, um, what the exploiter wants them to be. And that's where you get to turning out. Every traff, every individual, every survivor that I've ever met always recalls the first time that they were turned out. That is the point where an individual turns their, their first trick. They're leading a good life, whether or not it, um, whether or not that individuals will go into kind of some of the landscape of the, the different type of exploiters, um, whether or not it, it's booked by the force, the fraud, the coercion, that is the point where they do that first trick. And as one uh, trafficker told me, he, he said, you know, if I can just get them to do their first trick, then I know I can do, I can get them to do it a thousand more times. So that is the, that is the, the, the crossroads where you are getting an individual to, um, to you're creating that autonomy from any of their friends, their family, you're bringing them over to, to this other side and making them feel as if they, they do, they have no other option than to keep doing what they're doing. So here's a bit about the landscape of exploitation. This is the different type of um, individuals. Uh, to, we've got the pimps, we've got the third party trafficker that they can be any gender. Oftentimes we, uh, again, you know, television paints this picture where we've just got the, um, we've got like that, that male uh, figurehead, you know, that the pimp with the gold and the suits. Well, no, now we know that traffickers come in all races, all genders, all ages. Um, there is gang-based, there's family-based, there's survival sex, there's the independent um, renegading, self-manage, peer-to-peer, and then just other exploitation, especially now, as we know, with the pandemic, uh, that really pushed a lot of online media presence where it became easier to hide behind the camera, but also people needed to generate income. So that was for some who lost their job and felt like they might not have any other option, that also become an outlet for individuals to be able to, to um, be in their room, but be exploited through different uh, pornography, webcam, um, stripping, dancing, um, uh, only fans, all of those. So pimp and the third party control. Uh, with that, we've got the boyfriend, we've got the Romeo type. Those ones you do use, they, they use promises of affection. That's the individual in the mall who recognizes the person. Oh my gosh, you are the most beautiful person I've ever met. You are so smart. I, I, I just, I feel something for you. Like I've never felt for anyone before. They're going to romance the, the individual. They're going to give them uh, all just showered with affection and take them out and, and wine and dine them and just let them think that they are the center of their universe. In contrast, those gorilla pimps, those ones are definitely going to, they're going to use violence. They're going to use threats. They're going to, um, especially if an individual has some substance challenge, they're, they're going to increase that substance. They're going to increase it to the point where the individual often is incoherent, doesn't really understand what's going on because it's just right over the threshold. So again, they can get, um, they will be able to stretch the individual a lot further without that pushback. They do typically set a quota. Look, you need to go out there. You need to get me this amount of money. Um, if you don't come this back, 
that something's going to happen to you. And that's, that is when they will use the force on the individual. Um, you'll, you'll see different individuals with bruises and, and with open wounds. I have seen, you know, um, oftentimes they, they will also tattoo their, um, uh, so tattoo the, the males and the females under them to uh, as a signal of control over those individuals. They do tend to be mobile. I know uh, I've done a lot of work overseas um, in, uh, in both Asia as well as the Middle East, but uh, in the U.S. I've been on the, the West Coast as well. So any of those corridors, we have a lot of movement on the corridors. You, the, the pimps don't want to keep an individual in one place for too long because that draws attention. They, so they want to keep the individual there for a short period of time. It's fresh. And then they'll move on to the next destination. And they will typically go in like triangles, uh, but also just up and down different corridors. Then we've got the gang-based exploitation. The gang-based is also, um, so I was, uh, for about seven and a half years, I was also um, working in war zones um, and with, a, with a terrorist organizations. There, it was very common. On, um, unexpectedly so common to trade females as rewards and as as um, like territory getting along to, to show favor to other terrorist organizations it they would trade different females um that is the same with the gang base um oftentimes there will be a gangs i know there's a um a mongolian uh gang that i was working with in, in fresno california um for a while they they were very well known for trading females within uh, within the Mongolian gangs right there in Fresno, as well as with other Mongolian gangs outside, again, just as favors. Um, some of them take it upon themselves to um, be pimping victims on the side just to generate more income. Lots of threats of violence and humiliation. I will release all these pictures of you. Um, if you don't do what I say, besides you're one of us, we've already initiated you into the gang. Um, often it is, uh, there will be several gang members who are, um, who are violating the, the same individual. They'll, they'll get passed with in, in, within the gang as well. Um, they do typically give um, the, the, the victims some small amount, some small token, because gangs are also known. Um, there will be an individual, it, they don't stay with them full time. A lot of times it is like extended weekends. It's like, let's say this is Memorial Day weekends, right? This would be a time where it's not unexpected for a, a person to be, you know, to go out, to go picnicking or, or go camping or whatnot. And so they will go for like long weekends or they'll go for nights and then they just make them home uh, during the nights. So some families, because again, Human trafficking and, and sexual exploitation, it occurs across all borders. So even um, there were a lot of families that live in the suburbs that had no idea even that their children were being exploited in such a matter because they would come home every night. They, they would notice the grades dropping. They noticed them becoming withdrawn, but without knowing that there are, um, it's not just one avenue of exploitation. There are so many. And that's what sometimes makes this all so much more difficult to pinpoint. And then there's the family-based exploitation. Um, in some cases, it is, it's what's always been done, right? My mom did it. My grandma did it. This is how I generate income. This is how I provide for the family. Um, in some cases, uh, maybe some of you have wrote, read uh, The Road of Lost Innocence, Somali Man, uh, Cambodia. You know, she talked about it in that book about how um, she was turned out when her mother could no longer afford the rent for where she was staying. And so she, uh, she was exploited to that landlord who then uh, continually exploited her as, uh, as a method of paying the rent. So oftentimes children are exploited in that way if needs aren't being met, if there's not food on the table, and if rent is unable to be paid, that's where families um, offer have offered uh, children up. And that's where all the pornography comes to. There's an insane amount of child pornography. And a lot of this is to to just feed, um, feed that need of individuals that have uh, perverted senses. Then we have survival sex. This is um, this is a lot of what we come across right here on the streets as well. This is exchange of sex for basic needs. Um, I don't have anything. I do know I, I have a body. I, I, it's, it's cold outside. It's raining outside. I don't have any food. A lot of, um, a lot of the, the, the folks I've worked with on the streets, um, one particular, um, younger male comes to mind. He would tell me that 
there was never a day where if he wasn't sitting in one of the many parks in DC, and um, if he sat on one of those benches on the outskirts, every single time he would sit there, somebody would drive up in a vehicle and ask him if he would like to go to their house for the night. Uh, he and he that's not the the only individual. Uh, there's a, a lot of the um, a lot of the females that we work with as well. That is one way that they get their needs met met. They feel as if they are more in control of that. But in in reality, it's it's definitely commercial sexual exploitation. And oftentimes, especially with our younger ones, if you're under the age of 18, it is human trafficking. You don't you don't have a say in it. It is ex exploitation and trafficking. Um, but that's uh, incredibly common in D.C. as it is uh, across the United States. Then we have the independent or the self-managed. This is um, I met a um, I met these two females when, in Portland, Oregon, when I was uh, when I was working over there. and. Um, this is where oftentimes there will be a um, there will be a, a a couple females or a couple males or sometimes even maybe three that will get together to to really watch over each other in order to um, in order to make sure each other is safe. But like for these two females, one of them uh, they would both put an ad in the paper because they were different heights, different color hair. You know, they had their different qualities about them, and depending on who responded to the ad. Um, the one would answer the door, they would rent a hotel room. And, you know, you think about it, hotel rooms, a uh, hundred for, for a night, but then you have a, a John coming into the hotel room. And if you've got even, you know, just one John will pay for the, for the room for the night. But then if you have several, then you're able to, to afford a lot more than that and able to afford, you know, the food that you need to survive as well as whatever other needs that you might need. So for them, one would hide in the closet. Um, she said that she had a, a big kitchen knife and she would hide in the closet with just the door, um, with the door, just a, a little thin line. So she could watch her friend just to make sure that nothing happens. And if something happens, she would jump out and help protect. Um, there is a lot of, again, especially since, um, since the pandemic, there's loads, uh, hundreds and hundreds of sites as fast as they shut down the sites of um, that are exploiting folks as well as that are just advertising um, that more sites are coming up. So that is a constant, a constant struggle for uh, for law enforcement um, as they go through. Um, and actually, there's another um, another female as well for her. So she was 16. She was she told me this was in Southern California. She was waiting at a bus stop. And um, it was dark at night and an individual came up to her and said, hey, I will, um, I'll, I'll, I'll give you, I'll give you 50 if, um, if you, uh, you have sex with me. And she's like, no, no, I don't do that. He's like, okay, okay, I, I'll, I'll give you 75. And she's like, well, she's, she told me that she'd already been having sex. So, you know, what's, what's uh, having sex one more time for, for that money? So uh, she did. And then what she realized uh, the next day, she's like, um, you know, kind of went through her mind. She's like, well, that wasn't actually so bad at all. So the next day she put on a little bit more makeup and went exact, went right back to that bus stop and, um, and, and did the same thing again. So for her, it wasn't necessarily, to, she wasn't turned out by a pimp, but just by, by a buyer at a chance, at a chance encounter at a bus stop. And so we do find that also. And so now, you know, with all of that being said, we're looking at some of the risk risk factors of individuals. Uh, we've got the individual, we've got the environmental, we've got the social. Going through here, you're going to find some common themes. You've got the homelessness, right? You've got uh, people of color, LGBTQ, um, individuals with mental instability, with substance challenges. We've got poverty. We've got um, we have a lot of a, a lot of individuals that identify as LGBTQ that also has a higher percentage than um, than you would expect that are experiencing homelessness as well as that are on the streets. I do not think I know one individual who identifies as LGBTQ that has not been assaulted at some point while on the streets. It is a constant struggle, and in many cases. Um, and in many cases, they have been they have been kicked out of their house because of how they identify. So that combined, especially with individuals, 
um, uh, uh, people of color um, combined with uh, family dysfunction, all of these are risk factors that create that vulnerability. Um, undocumented migrants as well, we have a constant influx um, all over the US of, uh, uh, with those. And that comes with the added barrier as well. If um, if you don't know the, the local language, or maybe it's just not, you're not as uh, as able to, as fluent as you would like to be, then if you're undocumented and you don't know the language so well, your your job prospects are severely limited. And then you're looking for anything that might come along. And that's where oftentimes even labor, if it's not um, sexual exploitation, comes in the picture. Uh, mental health concerns, we see so many that have different mental instability that might be off their medication, where the predators, you know, they seize those opportunities to take advantage of those. So who's vulnerable, right? Here's the top five risk factors, vulnerabilities for labor. And then on the right is um, the vulnerabilities for sex. So again, we've got the unstable housing. So you see that on both, right? The mental, um, the mental health concern, substance challenges, again, on both individuals who've been incarcerated. Often, uh, oftentimes, if an individual has uh, burnt those bridges, uh, especially where substances are, are, uh, are at play, when they're released from incarceration, they're very vulnerable. They're looking for some type of out, some type of a solution. And that's where, again, the predators see these and they seize the opportunity. Um, they look for the vulnerability. They look for their, uh, that they're use uh, coercion, runaway youth, which we'll talk about also in just a minute. Um, all that combined with the, um, the exploitation creates that vulnerable index. And here's the trafficking this is, um, you know, Polaris um, did a study with trafficking survivor experiences. 64% of those responding to that survey reported losing their housing due, due to trafficking or related abuse. And another 64% also reported being homeless or experiencing unstable housing at the time they were recruited into their trafficking situation. We, predators, traffickers recognize individuals when they're at their most vulnerable and they seize on it. And that is why it is such an incredibly lucrative business. Here, uh, safe and stable housing, it is vital for individuals who have survived human trafficking. There's nothing, you know, that is what they need. But the problem is even when individuals, um, when survivors go through it, as we saw on the video, if um, the rehabilitation only lasts for so long, so what do we do then? That's that is part of the challenge because if there is nothing set up, that's also when we see the individuals back on the streets and they they those interim solutions leave the, the victim still homeless and in increased risk of being trafficked again because they have they've they've known they've done it in the past. They understand um, what that they can go through the motions because it's already been done. In the with the youth population, one in five youth that were surveyed had been a victim of sex and labor trafficking or both. One in three runaways will be approached by a pimp within 48 hours of running away. And that again is why it is so crucial that it's it's a systematic, we need to change our system if we want to make an impact on those that are trafficked. One in three runaways. So I worked in conjunction with the Human Trafficking Task Force in, uh, in Seattle, Washington. Every single time there was, we had an undercover female young that looked young. You know, we dressed her up in, um, in just, you know, uh, high school clothes, just jeans and a t-shirt. She'd have a backpack every single time she got off that bus in the terminal within one hour, she was approached by someone that wanted to exploit her one hour. So while it says one in three within 48 hours, I can tell you from my experience, there are individuals always watching and always ready to act if they see someone that is vulnerable. Uh, foster care system is has a huge, huge output into individuals that um, end up being trafficked because once, uh, even with the folks that we work with on the streets that are experiencing homelessness, I have surveyed almost 300 individuals in the past couple of years. Um, one of the questions we ask 
is, have you ever been in the foster care system? We've got about 45% on the streets right here. And of course, you know, DC is its own little unique magnet because we have, uh, we, you know, we've got the FBI, we've got the CIA, we have the White House, we've got the Capitol. We've got a lot of draw for individuals that might be experiencing mental instability, but it is 45% of these individuals have declared that they were in the foster care system before becoming homeless right here in DC. So then what are some signs? You know, all that is good to, to um, all of that is useful knowledge, but we are not gonna be infected unless we, we notice signs that are happening in front of us. And I, I'm telling you, they're always happening in front of you. I can, uh, before I really became um, heavily involved in trafficking and just, you know, recognizing those signs and actually taking action, I can think back to a few occasions and they still bother me. They bother me to this day because I can think back to some of these occasions and they just didn't sit right. And without having that knowledge, I did not act. And if I, if the same situation happened now, it would be a very different response from me. So how to spot the signs of the trafficking? You know, there are some signs that are going to be more obvious, you know, um, that the victim may have downcast eyes. Um, someone else is always speaking for the individual. Um, some some individuals will actually disclose to you a great way of if you're um, if you're feeling so your guts telling you something is off with an individual. And let's say she walks into the bathroom. That is a fantastic way to um, to be able to get her her uh, her alone and just ask some of these questions. Say, hey. Are you okay? You know, one female, she, when she was finally, when she was finally rescued, she told me I was just waiting for someone to ask me if I was okay, if I needed help. You, we want to make sure to ask those questions. It's okay to ask, um, to ask the, the questions and have a, a reaction like, "Why are you talking to me?" That I would rather have someone upset with me for asking those questions that no one wants to ask and possibly being able to help save a life than being that person who's like, oh no, it's not my issue. Let, let me not get involved. Um, the, the National Human Trafficking Hotline right there at the bottom, everyone should have that in their phone. Uh, 1-888-3737-888. You don't need proof, but if you call that number, you, you know, that there's a situation, I'm at my storage, um, I see an individual uh, he's with a female. She she's not saying anything um, that their their ages are different, but she looks downcast. She looks a little out of it, like maybe she's uh, um, maybe she's experiencing some types of, of substance challenge. Something's not right. You don't have to do the investigation. You just need to report it. Call that number and someone else. The, the law enforcement will come out and then it's up to them to investigate it. So, again, it there is no. Um, you know, people uh, sometimes have told me, oh, I just, I didn't know what to do, or I didn't know if anything would happen. If I, if I, um, if I did call the number, I didn't have enough proof. Don't worry about the proof. That's on law enforcement to take that action and figure out what's going on. So here's some other signs, um, classic presentation. You can, um, in some of our folks, I will see like a whole variety of bruises, um, different stages of healing um, bruises, which show that, um, that, that something has taken place, right? There might, that in over, I haven't seen as many mutilations here overseas. I have seen a lot more mutilations, uh, but they might just be coming in and out of the bathroom. Maybe they are waiting for a bus, but you're noticing, man, that, that this person's gone in and out of the bathroom maybe five or six times in the, in the course of an hour. Maybe something is there. That can be, you know, the, the pelvic pain, the urinary difficulties. Uh, maybe they've got some back issues, um, malnourishment dental problems, disorientation, confusion, those panic attacks, those are a lot more common that we do see as well. Um, again, you know, any kind of activity like this, you can always, always report. You um, Only 1% of victims are ever rescued. It literally makes billions of dollars a year. It is the second illicit enterprise in the, in the world. And only 1% of victims are ever rescued. So you want to recognize the signs and you want to take action. And that um, that's kind of, I could speak for hours on this subject, but I, I hope that it at least gives all of you a little bit to um, a little bit to think about. And I, I want to leave a few minutes also, if you've got any questions, I'm happy to answer those. 
Um, also, if you want more information, if you want resources, if you, you know, we've got different, um, uh, different wallet size cards, as well as other like resource um, paperwork, or even just referrals to different studies that you might be interested in, or just uh, more in depth, you know, um, important to also recognize that not, um, not every male or female who who uh, is exploited in a certain way or even participates in some type of survival um, survival sex that that doesn't mean that they are orientated necessarily towards that sexual preference. It doesn't dictate gender. It doesn't dictate sexual preference. I know um, when I was in in Thailand up in, up in northern Thailand, you know, a lot of the the young boys they would go off with the men. They were, they did, they identified as straight and heterosexual, but for them, that was their survival mechanism. So that's important to recognize as well, that not just, just because someone participates in activity doesn't necessarily dictate who they are or their orientation. So now any questions from any of you uh, wonderful people? I have a question. Um, are you guys partnering with uh, a shelter facilities, or what is your process of getting someone off the street? Sure. So we actually, we work in conjunction. Um, again, partnerships are so incredibly important. I'm always looking for more partners, but um, we actually work with a, um, a, a few different nationwide human trafficking um, cohorts where we get different, uh, when we come across the situation, typically the best option is to move, um, to, to get the individual out. Like if it's an individual that is rescued in DC, you want to get the individual out of DC so that the, um, the individuals who are exploiting them are unable to find the person. So we, um, we work with in conjunction with several different agencies across the U S to get people to different safe houses, um, as well as get that rehabilitation because the safe house is, is um, is only so good to get the person that 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 initial first step, but then there is a significant amount of rehabilitation that needs to happen. As you know, being traffic is very um, emotionally and mentally draining, as well as it, it's it's a it's a type of brainwashing in most cases. Um, but here in DC, with those that are experiencing homelessness as well, we have a number of shelters and organizations that we work with. Oh, that's great. Okay, um, Miss Kills, how are you today? I hope that you're doing well. Uh, she's asking, how do we motivate society to not blame the victim, which creates a cycle of returning? So true. That is so, so important. Yeah, we because we know we shouldn't be blaming the victims, right? Yeah. This is this, yeah. this is systematic. The victims um Slowly, there are. Um, I'm I'm happy to to report. I also do work in conjunction with a, a variety of law enforcement partners, and it is becoming more common where um, law enforcement are being exposed to recognizing the signs of human trafficking, so that they mm -hmm. treat um, they treat individuals. Because uh, in some cases, you know, they do arrest someone, not recognizing the individual is perhaps a um, a survivor to begin with, but mm -hmm. recognizing the signs asking the right questions so that instead of that individual being arrested, they are matched to an they are matched to um to an a person and an individual that can actually get them on that road to recovery. So mm -hmm. part of it, knowledge, knowledge as well. Get, um, once you know the signs, you can't unknow the signs. And it is up to to all of us to spread to spread that knowledge and empower other individuals with it so that they also can act. Yeah. And, um, you know, since I did do uh, my uh, dissertation in this area, you know, I always say that there are four components to sex trafficking. There's the trafficker, there's the victim, there's the sex buyer, and then there's uh, us, the community, our, our society. So we all uh, can play a part in this. And really, it's just about speaking up. Um, you know, as Dr. Amy is saying, being aware, uh, saying something, maybe if you're a part of a group or you can join a group. I'm a part of the uh, Prince George's Human Trafficking Task Force, as well as the D.C. Human Trafficking Task Force. Uh, partner with other agencies. Get involved. 
say something, you know, financially support uh, those who are out there on the front line, like H3 Project, and um, just one at a time, you know, uh, doing what we can, uh, definitely within our, our churches, uh, you know, train, our, our youth have youth groups and sit them down and begin to share this information with them. There's a, there are a lot of tools that's out there. Okay, uh, Matt Robinson uh, is asking, what rehabilitation do you offer and how effective is it? So all of our rehabilitation, we partner with other agencies. And so because we're street outreach, once we are able to, uh, to connect a, an individual with a partnering agency, that's when we step off. And that's for, that's for the safety of the individual as well. We don't want um, the, more, the more individuals that know where the person is. The, the higher the probability that the trafficker can find the individual. So we connect individuals and then we step off. And then depending, that's when they do a complete analysis of the needs um, of the person, how deep everything is. And that that involves also how long the individual was, what types of trafficking uh, took place. Um, and then that follow on takes place with that organization. Okay, Ms. Baker said, hi, Ms. Baker. Uh, she said, I would like to see these presentations being held in churches. Since churches have such a large platform, I attended a human trafficking workshop at a church in PG County a few years ago. And I can't even, I so agree with you, uh, Ms. Baker, and uh, that's work that we do with Healing Communities. So, uh, you know, invite us in, you know, we... <laughs> for free. Uh, our, our hearts are to just share this information. Um, I, I don't know, do you, I have a book. Uh, we also have free um, downloads on our website. Um, and, and my book is specifically uh, to churches in how, because I, I did my dissertation at Howard University School of Divinity. And so my book is specifically to churches about how you can go about work uh, having uh, conversations with men about this topic because a lot of women are involved but not so many men uh, and how to sit down with youth groups and and do the same thing so that's out there you have anything uh, to say to that okay all right uh next question jesse says can you provide guidance for an organization ministry that would like to launch a housing initiative for those who have experienced homelessness due to human trafficking. I am more than happy to make as many connections as um, as meets the, the need of folks. It, again, we're all about like partnerships and connections. So if you reach out to me, I, I'm very happy to um, to connect you with folks who, uh, depending on what where your location is and what the parameters are can hopefully help you out. Yes. All right, are there any other questions? Anything else? Any comments? I think yes. we've got a hand raised. Denise, okay. this is Chris Eels. Chris Eels. Mm -hmm. um, I've been watching, um, what's his name? Um, oh, I can't remember that. Anyway, popular shows like Power and uh, yeah. Family Business and BMF. These mm -hmm. all shows that talk about kind of the history of uh, 50 Cent. That's the artist I'm looking for, 50 Cent's a music artist. Um, they show how the drug market gets started, but what it doesn't show is how women are abused even in the midst of that. And, and oftentimes when there's a complication, women are used sexually to address that complication, which is a form of human trafficking and prostitution. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think that um, 50 Cent is doing a good job, a great job of talking about how substance abuse is functioned as an industry. But I, again, I think the media is, is demoralizing the image of people who are vulnerable, who appear to be vulnerable, and people who, um, who want the, the glass and, and shiny things, and they're willing to do anything to get those things or manipulate it into doing those things. So um, if you have time, take a look at some of those. 50 Cent has lots of them out there. He's making big money off of it. But again, it's not showing 
how women are trapped in that cycle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I was, uh, my husband and I, we just celebrated um, our 30th anniversary and we uh, went on a cruise. We did the Northern Europe cruise and in their advertising, the different excursions, uh, this was in Belgium, they showed uh, the brothels as a place that you can visit. And I was like, I was shocked. I was like, oh my God, they're actually advertising. Oh, if you take this excursion, here's one of the places that you can visit. And, you know, they had all the pictures and everything. So, wow, this is very much alive. And we just have to speak up. We can see what can happen uh, like we've just seen in Florida where one mother decided that she didn't want that young lady's poem in her daughter's school. So we don't ever want to underestimate the power of one voice. As no, you know, I, I absolutely just, I appreciate that opportunity and all of you listening and you're 100% right. It never underestimate what you as an individual can do. Because to, together we are stronger, but sometimes it just takes that individual willing to take the risk and stand up for what's right that encourages and empowers others to do the same. Mm -hmm.